Beloved congregation, it is wonderfully good to be in the house of the Lord uh, again this Lord's Day, the day that God has set aside for us to worship Him in a, special, in a special way. May God bless us all, congregation and those who may be visiting with us. We hear a call to worship, which is a song for the Sabbath day, Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. There's a confession of a man of God who, who knows the God of men like himself who need to be stirred in their praise to God just like us. And we ought to be because our help is in the name of this God, our saving help in Jesus Christ who made heaven and earth and who moves heaven and earth and even sends his son to die for us that we might be redeemed to God. And so we would worship him. And for this, we need God's blessing. Receive it now in the sacred benediction. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 180. It is good to sing thy praises and thank thee, O Most High, showing forth thy loving kindness when the morning lights the sky. Three stanzas, 180. Being as we are in the book of Exodus, I wanted us to uh, turn to the law of God that's recorded for us there in Exodus chapter 20. We'll be considering the narrative in Exodus 18, the provision of the godly counsel of Jethro. But here, receive the words that Israel received at Mount Sinai the first time after a few months after their exodus from Egypt. In Exodus 20, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now you think of the New Testament light in which we have, and all of the pictures of the Old Testament are now spoken to us clearly by the word of God. We are delivered from the Egypt of sin, says the New Testament, and we know that from the Old as well. And by this God, who is Israel's God, the church's God, we are the people of Israel of the circumcision not made with hands, but the circumcision made of heavens, even the regenerating spirit. And the blood of Jesus puts us in this status as people of God. We worship God and we would obey God as he says to us, also now in Exodus 20, I'm your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I saved you from sin through Jesus' blood. Now, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, and that would be thousands of generations too, who keep my commandments, who who love me and keep my commandments. Just a word on that 
that second commandment about making graven images. We are familiar with paganism by books and by travel, perhaps, and by the media, and they make things to represent gods, forces behind these things. They take from things on earth, they take from the sun and the moon and the stars, and they make golden things, they make wooden things, and, um, and all kinds of things to represent God, they say. Israel was prone to do this too, to imagine they could have God in front of them by this image that they would worship. Well, we can do this too, can't we? Because we're so sinful, we can imagine God. And what happens is we forget God's word and that God has spoken to us through Jesus, who's the express image of God. You know Jesus, you know who God is. Well, we, we depart from that. We depart from Jesus and the Bible, the Word of God, and we can conjure up maybe God's not kind to us when He says in His Word He is. Maybe God's not in control when it says in the words He's the one in the Word, He's the, he's the one who is uh, over everything. We can imagine all kinds of things. I don't know about you, but it gets me into trouble because then we imagine, well, then there's no hope for me when I sin and uh, there is no forgiveness and the blood of Jesus isn't enough. It's, it's really idolatry. We're inventing another God. And we can imagine in our topsy-turvy world that God's not on the throne and, and all those things. So let's not make those graven or mental images and maybe your young people need to be redirected by the Word of God today. Remember the Word, how God says in here, I'm your God, I love you, you're mine. And now you be transformed by your mind so that you can know God and know God in Jesus Christ revealed. What a great God we have. He's given us His image in Jesus and the Word, that's the revelation of of all that God would say to us. Imagine that, all that you need to know, you hear in the word, in the preaching of the gospel, in the context of the communion of the saints. There's the wonderful and positive, wonderful gift of the second commandment. And the third, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Emptily, for the Lord your God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. It's part of it. And do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea that is and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, not only for himself, but for us. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. In the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, that's the seventh commandment. You shall not steal, the eighth commandment. The ninth, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, anything that you might desire that's not meant for you. Oh, beloved, we are beloved, and we are to be reminded of that in the very giving of the law, the first time codified, written with the finger of God in stones, because God wants us to know he loves us that's why he gives us this, these wonderful words articulating his will for us. And Jesus summarizes it and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you're wondering what to do, wondering what the Bible says you ought to do, wondering what you should do in your personal life. First of all, do this. Remember God, and for God's sake, love God back, the God who loves you, and then you will know how the details of your life are going to play out. 
as you're seeking his kingdom and his righteousness first. Beloved, God loves you and underneath are the everlasting arms and he loves you to call you to himself, to remind you of Jesus and your deliverance. And now the way we should go, the way of the narrow way of holiness to the Lord. Let's sing now in response to the reading of the word 250 in our Psalter hymnals, deceit and falsehood I abhor. Of course, if we're a commandment in uh, keeping people, we, we hate all kinds of deceit and falsehood, but we love the law and the truth revealed. Three stanzas, 250. Beloved, the law is our delight, God's standard of holiness. It's our delight, though we cannot keep it perfectly, but we're reminded that this holiness, which we endeavor to have, is something that Jesus had on our behalf. <clears throat> He's our righteousness now through faith. Imputed to us is his own record of innocence before the tribunal of God, and now imparted to us is this beginning of a righteous obedience, the new beginning. So we love the law, not in a way, as a way to condemn us, but reminded of that from which we've been delivered, and then the standard of keeping the commandments so that we can show our God is different. Our religion is exceptional. Our Savior is the outstanding Son of God, revealed in this book revealed in our hearts and in our lives. Beloved congregation, prayer is the way we show there is a living God who hears sinners and their pleas. Let's pray together then. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful unto you, the holy God, thrice holy. And Isaiah was perhaps at the very beginning of his ministry, vouched, saved a revelation of you on the throne and angels around with wings covering their faces and with swiftness going to serve you, but crying out for the benefit of Isaiah and all the prophets and us, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Father, though Isaiah was so struck that he 
could only say, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. Nevertheless, there's a coal that was used from the altar to touch his lips, and he was sanctified, set apart for the work, a child of God, a minister, an ambassador of the great truth of the gospel. And we pray, Father, that in this house we may have something like that, though we need not visions. Those are Old Testament ways in which you spoke, but we need Jesus, Lord. We need to hear that you are the holy God revealed in him. He's the brightness of your glory, the express image of your person, whom to behold is to behold the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We thank you, Lord, even as we pray that we may behold you in Jesus, because certainly you're going to answer us. You're the one who works the prayer in our hearts just for that, that we may be a people that hallows your name in the name Jesus, and coming by faith in his righteousness alone by which we're saved and justified and and brought into the courts of God. And Lord, we pray that this whole worship may be Jesus-centered like that, in our prayers and giving presently, in our preaching and hearing, in our singing and benedictions, and in our giving and receiving, and in everything drawing near to you. Father, we pray, bless us. And bless us through the mediation still of Jesus, who though he finished his atoning work on the cross, has much work that he has to do and does in heaven, ruling all things in power for the good of the church and in grace for that church, and mediating as he prays without ceasing for the elect of God. We pray, Father, for Jesus' sake, in answer to his prayers, hear us, guide us, sanctify us, give us peace. We are, Lord, very much aware of how sinful we are, but actually we don't know the half of it, even less than that. We're so sinful. And this is what we come to church with. We come to the altar of prayer with our sinfulness and the knowledge of it. And though we've been exhilarated by how you've spoken to us and dealt with us so Mercifully, in the very beginning of our worship, as we draw closer, as even Old Testament priests would go from the common place, the holy place, to the holy of holies, we are melted in the shame and guilt of sin. And we confess, Lord, that sin, every one of us. We pray, have mercy. Help us to taste and see mercy. Mercy is individuals who can't stand for a minute on our our own, who shy away from cross-bearing Christianity, though we're good at pontificating about some truths. But when it comes to following Jesus where he leads and where There must be a public display of his glory in the midst of a mocking world we just shy away. When it comes to being consistent until it hurts, until the old man is crucified, we're not good at that either, Lord. And sometimes we're not even good at confessing the bare minimums of the faith of our fathers living still. We just are those who forget And we forget truth, and we forget that you've been around before we got on the scene. We think the whole world centers around us. We're sorry, Lord. We pray as a congregation that you would forgive congregational sins, ministerial sins, elder sins, deacon sins, parent sins, and single person sins and spouse sins, all the sins we commit in our offices, in our callings, in our relationships, our condition. 
And we ask, Father, that because we know you're going to answer and, and you even do as we pray, we might then reflect the fact that we've been forgiven, that there is forgiveness with God. As we love you, draw near to you, as we forgive others, as we are those who have the clean slate and we know it, we're assured. God, we pray right in our hearts by your spirit, the very truth of all the pages of holy writ. Give us to be living Bibles so that people can read us and know God and ask of us a reason for the hope that's within us, for the joy that's within us, for the resoluteness that is in us in the face of all opposition and when the the boss doesn't give us the raise because we refuse to desecrate the Lord's day. And when the friends mock us who we thought were friends but who want us to drink and drink and drink again with them. Lord God, may we stand for the crown rights of Jesus as a country that is the holy nation, the church of Jesus Christ. We are thankful, Father, that we're in this nation that there's freedoms here. There's something still of the, the faith of the fathers, many of whom were instrumental in the guiding of the writing of the documents that have directed us for hundreds of years. We're grateful for that vestige of what it was in the beginning. Lord God, we pray then that you would give us to be faithful citizens, but especially, Lord, of the Church of Christ, the citizenship that we have in heaven, may we celebrate that. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be grateful for all that you give to us and all that you give of the, the provision from the, the clouds. Thanks for the rain so needed. Thanks for the thunder and the lightning that's so Amazing, this heavenly fertilizer in this cause of growth. And we're reminded that you're the only God who, who alone gives the increase. We pray, Father, bless the work of our hands, all of it. So dissociated for most of us from the fields and from the, the farms and from the raising of the pigs and the cattle and so on for most of us. And we can take for granted then these things. And we pray, Father, help us to be truly grateful for the very breath that we have, for the, the families that we have, for the friends that we have, for the time that we have, the short time on earth, for the strength that we have, little as it may be. We thank you, Father, for the ministry of the gospel and the minister and the elders, and also the deacons. And at this time, as announced in the bulletin, we, we thank you for the work of Elder Biker. As he seeks officially to retire as emeritus elder, we pray your blessing upon him and his wife. We thank you for the good counsel of Jesus through his ministry. And we look forward to more of that. We thank you for... The fact that Jesus showed himself as God incarnate through this man and as he does through the other men who serve. We pray, Lord, give us peace as you guide us and you continue to guide us as we'll hear even this morning as we receive Jethro's counsel, which was truly divine. Hear our prayers, Lord, for your blessing upon those in special needs and bereavement. Think of the Van and Torn family, the Youngs. God have mercy upon them. As they mourn the loss of a loved one of Julia. And God, we pray, bless us with hope and with joy. Bless us with the lessons we need to learn from the one you've taken, as we say, in such an untimely way. Lord God, help us to not be resigned only, but understand even truly that you are great in this and your timing is perfect in these things too, your wisdom and your grace. And it's going to be that we're going to have wisdom and grace, we and our children, 
lose such precious gifts, to carry on, to carry on in the name of Jesus Christ, who says, carry on, and I'm with you. Though you pass through the waters and through the fires, I'm going to be with you. Though you must pass through them, I'll be with you, and that's the most important thing. And even if there be dens of lions, I'll be with you to stop the, the roar, maybe, and certainly the mouth of the lions from killing you, destroying you. Lord, hear our prayers. May we truly dwell on those promises. May we truly extol you, the God who's faithful in Jesus Christ, the yea and amen of every word you've ever spoken. The very reason by which the creation was created, the very pinnacle of your thought in the great eternity of your own being, the counsel of God, it's always been about Jesus, and so may our lives always be about Jesus, the wonderful God, our Savior. And Lord, hear our prayers, forgive our many sins, guide us in this worship for Christ's sake. Amen. Your offering this time for the general fund will be received. A very searching psalm with a prayer that the psalmist would know more the searching of God to discover if there's any wicked way in him. A very bold prayer. The psalmist, no doubt, was pleading with God to find Christ in him, and God answered that prayer. I'm going to sing the five stanzas, 288.
Let's take up our Bibles at this time and turn to Exodus chapter 18. Having just considered the incident of the Amalekites, the terrible enemies of Israel and their defeat because of the mediation of Moses typifying Christ, we consider now not an enemy, but a friend of Israel and the counsel that God, our friend, gives through Jethro. Exodus 18, we'll read the entire chapter. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And so it was in the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you're doing for the people Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people came to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that even every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, Then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. Thus far we read the word of God, and this will be our 
text, this matter of Jethro's counsel in the wilderness to Moses and to the Israelites. Just to refresh us, we've been considering this amazing epoch, this time in Israel's history when she's in the wilderness. She's exited from Egypt by the mighty hand of God and the outstretched arm of God, and most notably the 10th plague, the killing of the Passover lamb, protecting the Israelites, but that lamb's blood not covering the Egyptians' household, causing the destruction of the firstborn among the Egyptians. The people is in the wilderness. They're on the way to Mount Sinai at this particular time, or maybe they are there. There's some debate about the chronology here. Either way, they're near Mount Sinai. Well, there we receive laws, commandments, statutes, promises, building, uh, the laws for the building of the tabernacle and, and so on, so that they can be the holy nation of God. Now, as we've been seeing along the way to Sinai, really all the way in the wilderness, Israel is cared for by God. God is front and center uh, as the God of this people, whom the people uh, worship and rely upon. He has fed them manna in this waste howling wilderness, this bread from heaven, this wonder bread sufficient for every vitamin, sufficient for everything they would need. He also has given them quails. He has given them drink, even water from a rock, or has made the bitter water sweet. He's also given them guidance. There's a pillar of cloud for them by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so they know exactly where to go whenever that pillar of cloud would move or pillar of fire would move, they would know to follow that cloud representing God. Moses himself is a great leader of the people, not simply because he's somewhat familiar with the wilderness, having shepherded sheep on the backside of Sinai for 40 years, but because he's a type of the mediator, Jesus Christ. And then of late, we've seen that God is taking care of Israel by protecting them from enemies who will rise almost out of nowhere, we would seem, as uh, the great thorns uh, of the desert could not. These are these threatening Amalekite, half-breed Israelite enemies, sons of Esau, who hate the people of God and would interfere with their progress toward the promised land. Now... We are given to see in Exodus chapter 18 God's continuing care. This is no human thing here that's going on in the sending of Jethro to the people of God. They are, uh, or the, the people of God here are visited by God in Jethro, who is this priest of Midian, who is this in law, yes, imagine that, help from an in law, who is a friend of God and a friend of Moses in distinction from the Amalekites. Maybe that's why it's presented here in Exodus 18. Exodus 17, the last part, the Amalekites, enemies of God. Exodus 18, friend of God in Jethro. Now we have a reprieve in this not only good advice, but wisdom from heaven. Jethro comes with Moses' wife, Zipporah, whom he had married, uh, with uh, Jethro's blessing, and with whom he'd had two children, Gershom and Eliezer. Not going to focus on any of that, though that would be interesting um, to comment and to reflect upon this giving of Moses, his wife, back and his children. But we want to focus upon this as sacred history. We've been doing that. We do that here. The Bible in the Old Testament looks forward to the New Testament. The Bible in the Old Testament is the Word of God. The Bible in the New Testament is the Word of God. And the one Word of God is Jesus, the care of God, the God who's with the people and with us in Jesus. And dare we, uh, we, we, we dare not neglect the fact that also this counsel of Jethro is God's Word for us. There's something very important for us to remember here 
in the leadership of the congregation that God gives to us as we uh, reflect upon this council of, of Jethro. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, 1 through 6, and the appointment of the deacons, the occasion of the promise or the problem of the Grecian widows that weren't being cared for, there may be reflection in that counsel that they gave the apostles that they knew something of the Jethro wisdom. They were following the Old Testament pattern of how to lead a church. We ought to remember that as well. To avoid on the one hand hierarchy, on the other hand anarchy, and in everything to be led to Christ that the congregation may have its problems solved in the light of the word of Christ through the leaders God gives and especially through the mediation of Jesus himself. So Jethro's counsel, we need to hear this today. First of all, that it exalts Jesus Christ. Careful that we bring this out right away. This isn't just self-help. It isn't just to keep Moses from burnout. It's to reveal to us the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. And that's what God did way back then, and he does it today. And then we want to heed that counsel, to apply it to today, and expect the great blessings that God promised through Jethro and they experienced as well. So we have a friend here, a friend, this Jethro of Moses and of, of course, Zipporah, his daughter who Moses married, and his grandsons Gershom and Eliezer. He's a friend as well of, of Israel. This isn't just a, a flesh and blood thing. And we need to remember right away that religion is not just a flesh and blood thing. We're here not just because some of us are flesh and blood. We're here by the grace of God and the Spirit of God. And, and this is what is moving Jethro at this time to come to Moses and to discern what's going on, and he's moved as well by God to give wisdom. He is, in fact, called a priest of Midian. He must have been, it seems to many of us who study these things, that he was born of Abraham's seed through Keturah. And Keturah, his wife of his old age, uh, bore Midian, and he would have been uh, one of the, uh, the offspring of Midian. And he's a priest there. And he's the priest of Midian. And here he shows that he's a friend of God. For when Moses rehearses all that God did in delivering Israel from the Egyptians, Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who's delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro's glad for this deliverance. Jethro's glad for the care of God of this people. Jethro is linking up with all of the people, the Jews that Moses represents. It's not just going to be we're close family here, but Jethro's showing he's of the family of God. There's something here, even though his, his faith must have been not near as strong in his intelligence of the God of Israel, not nearly so clear as Moses and the others, yet he had this, this faith, this germ of faith believing in God. And, and look what he says as well. He's a theologically astute one. He says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. There's something striking here. Jethro learned the lesson of what the plagues were all about. The plagues were all about God versus the gods. We saw that when we went through the plagues and the history of the plagues in Exodus. There was a sun god that was put to naught by the darkness of the plague, uh, for example, of darkness. And there were the other gods. The Nile River was a god, and that was turned to blood at the rod of Moses and the command of God, showing that God is God. God is the source of light, and God is the source of water and of, and of life itself. And 
Jethro recognizes this. I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Now I say to you, congregation, and, and those who may be visiting here for the first time or for a, more than a first time, for those who may be visiting on the internet with an ear to these things, and may God give you an ear to hear this. Here is the germ of all religion. It's called the truth of God. Jethro is drawn to Moses not only by flesh and blood and not only because, well, maybe he wants Moses now to, to care for ones for Zipporah and the grandchildren, but by God and to declare God and to be an encouragement to Moses here of the friendship of God and the godness of God. God is above the gods. God is above all the gods that could ever seek to keep God's people in bondage. It's something of which I was reminded even this past week. Someone stops by, I don't even know the person, the person knows me, we start talking about God and our connection in the church of Christ. What an encouragement. Not expected, not sought for by yours truly, but the fact that God had a person in my life, brought into my life to say, I know you, I know your God. We used to worship together. That was an encouragement along the way of the wilderness. And Jethro is for that right away to remind Moses, though you've just been fighting and you're weary and this people is fighting against you and against God, God is God. You're God, Moses. There are no other gods. He's the great being, the I am that I am. Jethro, no doubt, didn't know that so much, but Moses did. God is the God of the burning bush, the unchangeable God of covenant. He loves his people and that will never be thwarted or changed. And he can stand the idolatry of the wicked. And he puts them to shame and their gods to shame. Our God is in the heavens, the psalmist would say, Psalm 115, he's done whatsoever he hath pleased. But the other gods, the other forces, and maybe the other forces in your life, you know they have no real power. You're making them up as if you are controlled by them. Some reason you're being proud about your God, about the fact that you're relying on a bottle or some other thing, or that you're captive to a person and the remembrance of a person and of abuse maybe in your family, you know... That's bad enough and not to belittle those terrible things that might have happened in your life. But we make a God out of these things when we let them control us. Moses is met here by a man sent from God to teach of God and to rejoice in the victories of God. Then, at the same time, he's going to tell Moses, and you, Moses, are not God. This is what this whole thing is about. Moses, what are you doing? Right in the midst of the, the meeting they have, and they're showing Good Eastern hospitality, they're sitting down for a meal, haven't seen each other in a while, they're family after all, and they rehearse all these great things that God has done, not only in Egypt, but in the backside of the wilderness and so on. And then Moses, the very next day, I suppose, or maybe that day, is seen from morning until evening giving counsel to the many, and there must have been a lot of Israel who'd come to them with their problems. And Moses shows his zeal here. And Moses shows that there is a respect to Moses given by the people. They understand that 
He's the one who's been speaking with God. And again, this could be as the people were there at the base of Sinai and maybe already had received the commandments. That's going to be set forth for us in Exodus 19 and 20 and so on. But here it is, a, a kind of window into what was going on. And Moses is sitting there and the priest of Midian probably goes like this, wow, I'm tired just, just looking at you. And I wanted to have lunch for you, but no, you said I'm too busy with whatever he was doing. He was zealous for the cause of God represented in the people of God who had all these problems, and they came to Moses because, hey, you want to go to the MD, maybe first, and not the PA, and not the nurse, and certainly not just the technician. You, you want the guy with the pedigree, the, the degree. And for Moses, of course, they were saying, we want this man who has an in with God. And so there they were, and Moses thought, well, I have to do this. This is, this is my, my job. No, it's my calling. This is my love. I love to care for the people of God. And Moses uh, here is rebuked. It's amazing. Moses' father-in-law said to him, after Moses explained what he was doing, he was doing a good thing. I make known the statutes of God and his law. What a great thing. Uh, Moses' father-in-law is not impressed. He said to him, verse 17, the thing you do is not good. The good that you're doing is not good. Isn't that amazing? You ever do that kind of good? And you justify it's good. Minister, you ever do that? Elders, you ever do that? Parents, you ever do that? On the job, honey, the reason I'm away so much is because I've got to earn a living for us and it's good. Your wife ever tell you the good that you're doing is not good? Is too much? You're taking too much upon yourself. You're not recognizing your limitations, and that's really what Jethro was saying here. You, both you, verse 18, and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen to my voice. I will give you counsel. And I trust that this is from God. And the counsel is to delegate. To appoint others to take care of the small things. And you take care of the bigger things. Maybe the harder things. The thing is not so explicitly articulated in the Bible from which you have to draw implications and ramifications and be an exegete of the law of God and the promises of God, all this stuff. That's for you, Moses. Okay. For other people, there are who are able and who ought to be able, and they can take care of these other things as much as you. Now, beloved, this is all that Moses may know he's not so tall. This is wrong of Moses, this good, that he might know that he's not so strong, even though he was strong enough. He was a strong man at 80 years old. His strength hadn't withered from him, but it would be this fellow said, Jethro. You see, Moses had to know in light of the God who's great that he is not so great. There's only one God. It's not Moses. It's God. He's just a man in between the people and God. Important enough. No other position like it, representing Jesus Christ. But he's not Jesus Christ. You see, in the Old Testament here, maybe you're not familiar with the Old Testament. Old Testament is all about pictures being painted and promises and prophecies made of Jesus. And one of the ways that the Bible speaks in the Old Testament of Jesus is through many kings and many prophets and many priests, all of whom were pictures of Jesus, but there needed to be many. 
And the offerings that they made could not take away sin. And the words that they said were tainted with their own foolishness and, and their own bias and so on. There's only one Jesus, but they all pointed to Jesus. There were types of Jesus, as was Moses. Jethro had to be used of God to remind Moses, though what he knew of this, I don't know, that he was not Messiah. He was simply a servant of God to lead the way and to lead the people. And that's exactly what we need to remember as ministers and elders and deacons, as those official representatives. But you parents and others in positions of authority need to remember that too. You're not God or God's mediator, even though you're a leader. And Jethro reminded Moses of his calling, that he must stand before God, to be sure, just focus on that, stand before God, I think it's verse 20, 21 somewhere, and... uh, or verse yeah, 20, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they may walk and the work they must do. Oh yeah, in verse 19, God will be with you. Stand before God for the people. That's the first thing, that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and so on. So stand before God, meaning pray before God on behalf of the people. That's your first job. Then, Moses, you teach the people as you've been doing, the statutes and the laws. That's the second thing. And you do that, Moses, and you have those priorities, and then you're going to be pointing the people really to God. Continue to do that, but don't be bogged down in all the details about, you know, this guy moved my landmark over there, and I've I've got... Come see over there. It's, it's three yards too far over there. And, and be bogged down in all of that. Moses, you simply stick with the basics here. The leadership of all the leaders leading to the gospel. You pray to God on their behalf and you instruct them. Those are the things he must be reminded. And Jethro even here, he, he sanctifies the whole business by offering a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. Isn't that amazing? And God must have accepted this burnt offering of Jethro and these other offerings to God. All of this pointing to the great mediator, Jesus. And there's something amazing about Jethro. I can't quite put my finger on it, but he sounds an awful lot like another priest who visited another father, Abraham. That's Melchizedek. You read of that in Genesis 14. Melchizedek appears out of nowhere. We're told in the Bible that his genealogy wasn't known. He's without father and mother, like he came from the sky, like he came from heaven, like Jesus, of whom he is a type, according to the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews. And Moses was this priest of the Most High God, this this king of Salem, Jerusalem, this inhabitant of the promised land before the people of the Exodus entered in. And Moses, or or Abraham, gave tithes of all that he had to this one who was greater than him, and, and there was blessing and there was peace. Well, similar is Jethro here. He's this man, this mysterious man, even though he's known to Moses as a family man, and he's not a type because the Bible doesn't make him a special picture, but there's something here about this Jethro, reminding Father Moses of Father Abraham and that needed, he needed help and that it wasn't about Abraham. It was about God, and it was about Jesus, who's the real king and prophet and priest. So, here in all, Moses is being told about the Jesus we know. And don't you thank God, beloved, that this is what 
this advice is all about, this counsel, wisdom, any wisdom is what God says in Jesus. Anything that points you from you to God is a servant of Jesus, who in his sanctifying work would have you look to his Father and have you rely on him. How we need that. We're so prone not to take the advice, not only, but to heed the counsel, the wisdom, and the commandments of God. Imagine if Moses had been like that, proud at this point. Uh, Dad, he might have said, Dad-in-law, you know, mind your own business. I got better things to do than you with all your sheep and I, it, it's okay, I'll, I'll follow it so far as, you, I'll, I'll, I'll heed your suggestion maybe, once in a while, maybe. Imagine if he'd done that. Imagine. He would have shown, you see, that he wasn't ready, really, to relinquish this great position of power that he had, even to God. It was becoming a Moses thing. The church was becoming a Moses church. That happens easily. We take the counsel of others very lightly and we take ourselves too, too seriously. And then it becomes more than just a, ba- a matter of burnout. It becomes a matter of pride, stinking pride. And the church shows it. Oh, that's that guy's church. And I'm going to go to that person's church. That one really has a personality. And the one who might have started out well, right from the gates, I am for Jesus, is no longer for Jesus. He's for a nice fat pension. He's for the reputation. And he really likes it when all the people come to him or her. My, what wisdom you have. What power. Moses was humbled by God. You read, in fact, not here. Well, you do read it here, the end of the chapter, that he heeded the voice of his father-in-law. He chose the able men out of all Israel. But especially you read that in Deuteronomy chapter 1, and verse 9. Let me read that. I spoke to you at that time saying, I alone am not able to bear you. Moses is saying here, the Lord your God has multiplied you, You've, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. Deuteronomy 1, verse 11, may the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, the thing which you've told us is to do is good. So Moses went to the people and said, choose choose you out leaders over you. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, here are the causes or the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who's with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that's too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. There's Moses reflecting upon what happened. Not mentioning Jethro here, but certainly reflecting upon the visit of Jethro in Exodus chapter 18. So Moses took the advice. There's something you see that reminded him really quickly when Jethro comes, gives this counsel, this is from the Lord. Why is it? Because Moses was reminded And Moses heeded the advice after the reminding that the people of God are just sheep. 
And God wanted Moses to be a shepherd of those sheep. He taught him for 40 years in the wilderness to do that, and now he was learning that as the ministerial shepherd. And see, right then and there, when a man realizes that the people under his authority are sheep and that he's to be a shepherd, that this whole thing, this business called church, is impossible. Because what are sheep? Completely dependent upon the shepherd. What are sheep? Well, they're prone to go astray. They cannot take care of themselves. They have all of these enemies. They get diseases and they turn over on the back and they can't even turn over by themselves. Certain times of the year especially. In every way, needy, dependent, vulnerable, and prone to say, my, the pasture on the other side of the fence is so much greener. So Moses had already, in these months leading up to Sinai, been struck by the fact that this is going to be a bad business here. These sheep. And now they're coming to me with all their problem. They, problem after problem, they're lining up. And yes, it's great, God's giving me wisdom here to deal with this, but I'm wondering how long I can, can do this. And so this counsel from Jethro and that we must have and receive today is so heaven-sent, so needed. God would govern his sheep this way. Through one man, two men, three men, a 20-man consistory, you get a big church, through parents, and then he would have the people submit to that. That's how he does this. He works here and exercises his own authority through officials that are appointed, and they have to be very able men, qualified men, as Elder Biker has been. They have to be able, it says, strong enough, of a good constitution. They have to be men of truth. They have to be those who fear God, and they hate, they hate covetousness. Those are the four things that Jethro told Moses these men ought to be. Men ought to be, not women, men. They have to be able... To fear God, to love the truth, they have to be men of integrity. They cannot show partiality. They cannot say, well, I'm going to favor Jethro here because he's kin. But I'm not going to favor that person there because they're not much. They don't have the pedigree. They don't have much to give me. No. Men of truth in the heart wanting God's word to be brought upon them, not hearing what others say, not hearing maybe the threats of those who are saying, if you don't, if you don't give me the advice I want, forget it. I'm out of here. Men who hate to grab things for themselves and maybe they're bribed, needed are good men. Good men of God. True to their calling to represent not themselves, not their families, not their friends, but God in the earth. God in the earth. That's it. Just to please God and not to please men. So there was need because we're prone to do the exact opposite. To say we honor God, but we don't honor the ministers, the elders. Or we don't act honorably as ministers and elders. It goes both ways. It has a great need. The apostles recognized this in Acts 6. You, you take care of the business of taking care of the widows, the Grecian widows, and take care of the problems with regard to that. Deal with it justly and generously. Appoint seven men for the business called deacons full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. 
But we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word, to prayer and to the ministry of the word, to exegeting, to studying, to the hard work of coming to the people of God week after week with truth and just truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, over against the lie, to apply it to the people of God where they're at, doesn't matter how old they're at, how new to the faith they're at, whether they're red, black, brown, yellow, or white, whatever. Sinners all, sheep all, need all to be led to the shepherd. This Leadership through delegation. Paul recognized Timothy had to have in 2 Timothy 2. The things you've learned from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. To faithful men. That's what this church needs. Faithful men. And that would mean not only the leaders, but those who follow God through following the faithful men. I learned just last night of a minister who's been about on the point of a nervous breakdown. That's real. And whatever reason that can happen, troubles in the church, troubles in the soul, he's not ordering his private life well, and that always go bad, goes bad publicly, you know. Well, he's back in the pulpit for the first time tonight. Local congregation. Been off for months. Depressed, distracted. It can happen for all of us. The theme of his sermon is the theme of a the same, the text, the same text that I preached on, I think, at that same church or maybe another church when I was installed there. And it was that text, six Corinthians, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And how true it is. How true it is. Just earthen pots. That's all I am, beloved. That's all Elder Biker is, and Elder Geisen, and Elder uh, Deacon De Young, and Deacon Baus. That's all you are in any position of leadership, in any position of fellowship. He's just an earthen vessel. And the treasure's a gift, and the treasure is dispensed of God through you, and often in spite of you. Here you are maybe wanting to hold the treasure in and God t knocks you over and lo and behold, we find the treasure through a knocked over minister, a depressed minister, a little guy who finally gets it. He's a little, little guy, a little man. And that this whole ministry thing is not about him at all. It's about God. And Jesus, so important. People, they had it right here. The people did. They, they came to Moses. They came to Moses. Sometimes we can, can err on the other side of that. We don't want to bother the minister with our problems or the elders with our problems. We just go to the, the professionals maybe. We go somewhere else. Or we just think we can handle things ourselves. That's another extreme problem. Not that professional counselors are wrong. Of course, there's a time and place for that, as well as medicine and psychiatrists and so on. I get that. But there has to be some understanding that God uses men and that we ought to be glad that God uses men. All the delegates of God, all the delegates which one plus one plus one, there must have been thousands in Israel at this time, and later on there'd be 70 appointed. They would become the Sanhedrin of Jesus' day, the 70 holy ones who would rule over the rulers. But all of those, beloved, one plus one plus one plus a thousand, that's nothing except there be the word and the blessing of God upon it. And this is what we can expect as 
I conclude this sermon. Blessing upon the earthen vessels because of the treasure within and the God who says, it's my wisdom. It's my delegation. I give an elder. I give one to retire. I give another to take his place. I give a pastor. Be content with that, not only, but glad. God is doing this for a God thing. There would be justice. That's what Jethro was concerned. There would be justice, and that's what we're concerned that there must be. There will be peace. The people, uh, this will be good for you, but then he says this will be good for the people. They'll go to their place, maybe to the land of Canaan, maybe to their homes in peace. They'll have their answers in light of the word of God, and maybe they're not so happy with it, but at least it's a, it's a start. And we can go on together, and we're not going to get little things and quibbles, uh, get in the way, or even great things and great concerns of ours get in the way of the far greater thing. Do you realize that, beloved? This congregation is united in Jesus Christ. Is that a small thing? Is united in the ministry of the gospel. Is that a small thing? Is united as one family of God. Is that a small thing? It's a great thing. It's the unity of the Spirit. This is testifying. Our worshiping here, week after week, our communing with one another, our praying for one another, our burying the dead of the congregation, marrying the people who get married in the Lord together, receiving new members, delighting in all things together because it's good of God to lead us together. And we glorify Jesus, whose blood is the establishment of our unity and whose spirit works in us to esteem each other more highly than ourselves. And to go our way, having heard the word, taking it to heart, humble, in peace. Hear the word of God, Israel, through Jethro not only, but through the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you give the word. We pray that those who've heard it may take it to heart all of us. And we ask, Lord, that you would truly give us to grow in the knowledge of you. Wonderful thing. You bless the people with the word of God. You bless with ministers. You bless with the most unlikely of people in a pulpit and to come to our house to nurture us. Lord, hear our prayers. and Guide us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing now in response to the word of God. Praise ye the Lord. 306. Praise ye the Lord. Let's sing uh, one and three and four, omitting the second of 306.
blessing and go in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.